Hello and welcome to a new video. My name is Tasman and I make videos on this channel about my life on the Azores archipelago, about becoming more sustainable and about books and things like that. I'm an author and I'm a freelance translator and writer and I'm an environmentalist, I guess. And I'm originally from Germany, but I live on the Azores archipelago. And in this series, the My Story series, I tell you the story of how that happened because it was quite the big journey. This is part five already of my story series. This is crazy to me. Uh, but if you haven't seen the other four episodes, I will leave the playlist linked uh, up above and down below. So please check that out because otherwise this video will not make a lot of sense to you. Uh, for everyone else, welcome back and I hope you enjoy this episode. I'm battling a little bit the light, the wind and the sound of the waves. I thought it would be a good idea to take you to one of my absolute favorite places, which is Ponta da Ilha. Uh, which is on the very tip of Pico Island and <laughs> well it was not the best idea at least not at this time of the day because everything is under bright sun it's super windy I found the only shadowy spot and I'm sitting here like this <laughs> to try to be uh, in in the shot properly but this is a very special spot to me. Um, not only because it is beautiful, because it's like a desert made out of lava, because it's a massive coastal area um, just made out of lava rocks, uh, but because I wrote a lot of the poems of my first book, The Anatomy of Waves, here, right here. I would spend hours upon hours on the lava cliffs here, listening to the, to the ocean, being completely alone, and just writing and this is basically where this book was born more or less so yeah i thought i'd take you here for this special episode this is gonna be an interesting video because those lava rocks are very very rough and they have destroyed many many clothes of mine already and i can feel them ripping on my pants right now <laughs> so that's gonna be fun i might sacrifice those pants that i'm wearing good they're not a good pair <laughs> So we left off in October of 2019 after I had this massive journey in 2018 on Pico Island and the Azores in general. I bought a one-way ticket and I moved to Pico without a plan, without even a house to stay in. <laughs> and uh, I came here, I spent some time with my friend Philippa, then the hurricane happened and that's where I left off. So the hurricane had passed and I got an invitation by an acquaintance that I have, a German woman that is also living in on the north coast. Um, and I accepted and I went to this uh, music night on the south coast, a place I'd never been. It was in the middle of nowhere. Like when she was driving in the dark up that hill in the middle of nowhere, I was like, oh my God, where, where are we going to go? Like, are you going to murder me? <laughs> no, just kidding. Because I had a lot of trust in her and another woman that was with us. We had a lot of fun driving there. It was really, really funny. We were laughing our asses off and we arrived and there were so many people, but the vibe was so good. This was for the first time that I attended an event here on the island, full of people of all ages that were just coming together to have a good time. Those events do exist here, definitely, um, but I had never experienced them before. The whole event was hosted by a man named Charlie, and actually you can book one of the houses that are in his land and uh, where the whole thing took place so i will leave that link down below you can stay there on your vacation if you want uh, it's called the studio in jinjera and he was doing those jam nights sometimes and um yeah i it was amazing <laughs> the, the the vibe there was incredible and i got to know a guy from greece and i got to know a bunch of other people and it was so crowded, it was so full, and everybody brought food, because that's like a big thing here. If you come together, you bring food. Um, and I was standing next to the food table, <laughs> and then new guests arrived, like all the time. And then one new guest arrived, and he had a cake in his hand. And I was like in such a good mood, I was joking around the entire time. And I ended up um, joking with him, even though he was a complete stranger and took the cake from his hands and said like, oh yeah, thank you for the offering, da da da. And uh, he didn't seem too impressed. <laughs> he actually seemed 
quite pissed off. Um, but I don't know, I just felt a pull towards him. So throughout the night uh, with the music playing and everything, I tried to get into a conversation with him. Like I uh, went outside all the time because he was outside smoking a lot uh, at the time. And I just went out there and I tried to have a conversation with him. And long and behold, the night was over. It was a glorious, amazing night and me, my the two women that i was there with uh charlie i think one more person and that guy were the last people left and we started talking a little bit more and we exchanged contact details and because we had been joking around so much i sent him a message on the next day um and we never stopped talking from that point onward and went on our first date on halloween <laughs> Throughout November, we were trying to figure out if this was something that would work because he was not too keen uh, about the idea of starting to date someone. And I was also not too keen of falling in love after that horrible year of 2019, where I had this massive breakup in the spring with my long term relationship and then this massive heartbreak in the summer, which was just a matter of weeks ago at that point, that for me, letting someone else into my heart seemed like an absolutely stupid idea and i was like oh my god this year was already bad enough <laughs> i don't i don't want this but the thing is love doesn't care love does not care and your heart wants what it wants and we had such a good vibe and we just we just became a thing and it was completely natural uh, <laughs> against both of us not really being like into the idea of it but we just liked each other so much so the month of November was spent trying to figure out if this was actually going to work um, we would spend every free day together because he was working a lot and I was living on the north coast he was living on the south coast I didn't really have a car I got a car eventually uh, for like a very short period of time. There were some beautiful moments in between. For example, one morning he got called by a friend of his who is a skipper on one of the whale watching boats. And it was, I think, the last tour of the year. And he was just like, hey, come on, get on the boat. And he was like, no, I can't because I'm sick, but I have someone here that will very much enjoy to go. And I went there and I was able to go on that whale watching trip and it was the most amazing whale watching trip I ever went on. We saw so many dolphins. It was pure magic. It was so beautiful and I'm so thankful for that. That's one of my favorite experiences I had here. And my favorite day that I had so far in my entire life also happened in November because we had spent this very nice day together and then we went to Charlie's place again that evening. We had a barbecue. We met a couple um that was staying with charlie at the time and he is from sao miguel his name is luis i wrote a whole azorian stories uh, article about him i will leave it linked down below he plays the saxophone he's an artist he's incredible and we would sit there and my part my now partner <laughs> spoiler <laughs> um, i think everybody guessed that um was playing guitar and the other guy was playing saxophone and the sun was setting super slow in the ocean and it was just wow it was just mind-blowingly beautiful and that was one of i i had to leave at some point because i was so happy i felt like i would explode <laughs> and i'm not even joking like the people can tell you i actually left because i was like i can't contain this happiness inside my body i feel so much joy but the thing was that i had already booked my flight back to germany i know i had said i bought a one-way ticket but the problem was that i went here without any preparation i was a little bit naive i didn't have a job i didn't have an income so i had looked ahead and i was like okay christmas will be in december and i will run out of my savings very very soon and i don't want to spend every last drop of my savings and then beg someone at home to buy me a ticket back to germany because i just fucked it all up so i went back to germany in december um and then the universe just had my back i guess <laughs> i arrived in germany and i was heartbroken that i had left this incredible life behind and this incredible man behind too um and 
I somehow was like, okay, I, I need to go back. So I booked flights for January, but I was like, okay, this will eat up the last of my savings. So I don't know how this is going to work because I need a job and I don't know how I'm going to get a job with me wanting to be on the Azores so bad. So because there is barely any work here and the work that is here, especially for English speaking people, is in tourism, which is badly paid, very stressful. And after my experiences, I didn't really want to go back into tourism. Like if I had to, I would. I actually had a job opportunity on Sao Miguel in tourism, but I didn't really want to live on Sao Miguel. I wanted to live on Pico. And I was not sure how that would align with me also needing to go to Germany sometimes to see my family because it was a very stressful job, and very badly paid. Um, the the people of that job opportunity were super nice if they're watching this <laughs> you were super nice but it was just not for me I had like <laughs> hello <laughs> it was a seagull that just pooped super close to me if you poop on me I'm gonna lose my mind <laughs> I don't want to say that this is a sign but I guess um that is those people that I had the job opportunity with um, sending me a sign. Um, <laughs> anyway, I had a massively bad... Now it's three. Three seagulls. Oh my god. Um, <laughs> anyway, I had such a bad, bad, bad gut feeling. And luckily, I once again listened to this gut feeling. Oh my god, I could have never predicted what would happen. But luckily I listened to this gut feeling and didn't take that job opportunity. I thought it would all be in vain. I thought it would be so complicated. I thought it would be a complete disaster and I questioned everything. And I talked to the universe almost every day and I begged for something to pop up that would just make this work because I was really starting to fall in love with this guy on this island and I really wanted to live here but I just didn't know how I would make a living and it was so weird because I had this job opportunity on Sao Miguel but I just everything in me was like no that's that that's not the right thing and then one week before the end of the year um, I got an email from the place that I had an internship at in the springtime where that I had interrupted to go on my on my tour guide job <laughs> my hair is crazy today and they were looking urgently from the first of January onwards somebody to replace someone that had left and it was a part-time job and I could work from wherever I wanted to and I swear to you I I was just speechless <laughs> I was like is this real am I dreaming like can somebody pinch me please like what it literally fell in my lap how lucky and privileged but how lucky do you need to be for this to happen <laughs> like i knew i did a great job at the internship but still like what what <laughs> completely crazy and of course i accepted of course i mean i mean and in January, it was a bit complicated because I had already booked the flights for January, but it, I made it work. And uh, in January, I was only here for a short period of time. Then I was in Germany in February. And then I was like, hey, since I can work from wherever I want, okay, I want to see my partner again. Because in January, we had lived together while I was here. Things were going great. And so I traveled to Pico in the beginning of March of 2020. And I don't need to tell you the plot twist because first of all, it's in the title and second of all, we all know what happened in March of 2020. When I was flying to Pico, there were already like the first things going around about the pandemic and that there was this new thing, but nobody really knew what was going on. It was like a sense of danger in the air, but it was not really clear yet what was going to happen or what that meant or how far it had spread. And I think about a week after I arrived on Pico, the Azores shut down. The borders were closed. They didn't let anyone in or out. 
there was no air travel. We were one of the first places that really completely shut down and went into lockdown, which was an amazing thing to do. And I'm not talking here about the fact that I was stuck here, <laughs> which just was like a dream coming true because I, I had planned to only stay like, I think three weeks was the original plan and then go back to Germany and then at some point come back and forth to be also sometimes in the office, you know, to make a good job. Um, but uh, I'm not talking about this. I'm talking about the fact that those nine islands here, we have a horrible healthcare system. <laughs> My island, Pico Island, doesn't even have a hospital. There are multiple doctors that don't exist here. Like when you want to see a gynecologist, there is one gynecologist coming once a month for I think two or three days. And you need to be lucky to get an appointment there, but they cannot do anything that is like more than just like talk to you basically, or just look really quick. Uh, and the same goes for many other doctors. I think we just have family doctors and dentists on Pico and we are one of the bigger islands like I don't even know how the situation is on Saint George, Graciosa, Santa Maria, Flores and Corvo I think it's similar or even worse and regarding Covid we only had I think two ventilators on the two or three ventilators on the island for 14,000 people and the doctors that are residents here are not even allowed to use them because they belong to the um, firefighters and they are the only ones with the license to use it like the doctors don't even know how to use these things like if corona had exploded here the way it has exploded in many other parts of the world we would have been <laughs> well my camera battery just died and I forgot to bring an extra pack because I am unprepared. But uh, let's try to finish this up really quick. Um, basically, it would have been an absolute catastrophe. We have a lot of people with lung diseases here on the islands because a lot of people smoke and work in the fields and with pesticides and these kind of things. We have a lot of uh, obese people, unfortunately, nowadays. And we have especially a lot of very, very old people living here. like the biggest part of the population is like somewhat over 60 70 years old so yeah it would have been a catastrophe if that would have happened um, so the government made the only right decision and completely shut the islands down and that went on I think for two months almost nobody was allowed to enter nobody was allowed to leave there were even tourists that got stuck here because I think there was only like a two day notice before they literally shut it all down. Like I didn't even register the, the notice. Like I, I would have gotten stuck. I got stuck because I had only packed a few spring clothes <laughs> like for, for March because I thought I would only stay three weeks in March and I was, I was stuck uh, on the island and I couldn't leave. And some of you may be thinking, ah, there would have been a possibility, like a ship or something. We are in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> the only option would have been a container ship, but sailboats were not allowed to enter or to leave either. Container ships were the only exceptions and even they were stopped in the very beginning. And there was no flights. There was the Portuguese government because Portugal mainland reacted way later to the pandemic than the Azores did. And they didn't take it seriously, like the, the head of state of Portugal, like throughout the entire pandemic, he didn't take it very seriously. And he was like, no, we are going to continue our flights to the Azores. And the Azores government was like, we are going to park our cars on the runway if we have to, to keep you from coming here. You are not going to come to the Azores. No one is coming to the Azores because we don't want to die. And yeah, it was it was a strange time. We were also not allowed to leave our houses in the first couple of weeks um, or the, the municipal. I don't know the English term. I will leave it here. Um, Gemeinde in German. <laughs> and um, yeah, we were stuck at home in this teeny tiny apartment of my partner's, which was so tiny. And I had to work from home in a brand new job. <laughs> I was just trying to figure out uh, it was a pandemic going on. Everybody was panicky. Uh, it was it was crazy. It was really crazy. But the good thing was very soon 
after the islands had shut down, I think like a month or two later, we were completely corona free and safe because of the incredibly strict restrictions when it came to leaving and arriving to the islands because of the very strict rules from the government. Not because we didn't believe in corona, <laughs> it's the exact opposite. Because the government was so strict on everyone, we had a normal life back within two months and were allowed to do almost whatever we wanted because we had zero cases uh, for most of the time. And that brought with it a lot of change because I decided to stay because it was too dangerous to travel and too difficult to travel. So I stayed on the island, but we knew we couldn't continue like this in this tiny apartment. So we had to find a solution and change something up. But that is a story for another day. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed this episode. Have a great day. Bye.